Kara, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me, Melissa. I've been looking forward to this. It's my pleasure. I have been also. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, I am a, a jack of all trades, and I would consider myself an authenticity strategist above all else as far as working with individuals and humans author, speaker, podcast host, and just a slew of other things, but all centered around the focus and theme of creating authenticity in everyone's life. Well, I can't wait to dig a little deeper into that. Um, and where do you, where are you zooming in from today? I'm in the Kansas City area, just about 30 minutes south of that. It's in a suburb called Overland Park. And so right smack dab in the middle of the country. Perfect. I love it. So, Kara, you didn't always do this work. Tell us a little bit about your life before and how you got into doing what you do right now. Oh, that's that's there's been many iterations of my life. So so the first one that comes to mind to bring up is I started into the workforce in the restaurant business and was working for somebody else and had my time and focus dictated by someone else. So. I spent 12 hours, sometimes 16 hours working, but I had a son and he was in a daycare center that I eventually found out he was being mistreated in. And so all of a sudden I quit and that turned into an accidental career in photography that led to being in the wedding industry for 20 years. And upon a life crisis, somewhere smack dab in the middle of that, I ended up in a Tony Robbins event and was just drank the Kool-Aid gulp after gulp. And that was that was my entry point into the personal development wellness space where you you just it was just a, a full blown veil tear of what I knew happiness, well-being, my, your, the way that you process your mind and deal with the things that you think about. I had never even thought that that could be a collaborative process. And so Getting into Tony Robbins' world was absolutely just like jumping into a pool of ice water. It was nothing like I had ever considered in my life. And so, of course, you know, started out volunteering, got offered a staff position, toured with him around the world. It was one of the happiest and most amazing chapters of my whole life. And eventually the staff positioning and w would require me to travel, you know, two to three weeks out of the month. So our paths uh, diverted from there and I started my own thing, but then immediately just got, you know, this was 2019 or so. And I just decided, you know what, I'm going to go back to what I know. I became a wedding professional again. And then the pandemic happened mm -hmm. and it became very obvious and glaringly aware that the things that I learned over the course of my career, as well as the things that I had learned developmentally and spiritually and physically and all of the stuff that I had Im used to improve my life was super, super relevant in this space where people are talking about anxiety and depression and being really, really aware that uh, in their own four walls on lockdown with nothing else to think about, there's a lot of questions that are going unanswered in the space. So Cue my stage re-entry into that world and started the podcast, just wanting to create a conversation where people are getting answers to some of these big life questions that they have. And uh, went full time after my brother-in-law lost his battle to PTSD in November or in October of 2021. And that was when, you know, I just I fully stepped with both feet into the arena of this space, understanding that there is a lot more people needed in the mental and emotional space and there are in the wedding profession. So that is that is the long-winded way of where I've gotten to today. Now, I've worked in restaurants and I do weddings and you see an interesting side of uh, human nature in those fields. Let's just say. <laughs> yeah, so. it, it um, you see the best and the worst. You see what 
the catalysts of stress and demands and collaborative efforts and even the hierarchy of job placement of what, you know, a boss or a regional manager or a director or just like regular employees, not to mention, you know, the wedding profession of that type of that type of event and that caliber of event, especially when it is just for, you know, some of them are just for the vanity metrics of throwing the biggest, best, most relevant, most trending party. And uh, some people that are actually marriage based as opposed to wedding based. And I would definitely say I observed some interesting people, but I would I mean, everybody has the opportunities no matter what you do. You could do DoorDash or deliver pizzas or be a congressman and all find yourselves in the throes of human, <laughs> the human condition. Absolutely. So you mentioned your podcast. Can you tell us the name of it and a little bit of what it's about? Absolutely. I named it in 2020, the Happiness Habit Podcast, because that was the where the conversations were centered around as people that just could not understand how they were so unhappy, deeply unhappy in their life. And it's transformed into little a little bit more of a a space for the deep, raw questions that are not getting enough airtime in the world. And so I would say it actually doesn't really revolve around happiness anymore. Um, it's just it's got such a great audience. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a stickler for not rebranding and changing just for the sake of, you know, what it is. My, my listeners that have been with me for, you know, going on four years now, that's... Um, We've it's kind of become a little bit of the jest of like, well, you know, it's the Happiness Habit podcast, but we're going to talk about suicidal tendency. <laughs> but it's a great place, and I love my listeners and my audience, and it's definitely not uh, something I anticipated still to be in my ecosystem three years later. So I'm really, I'm really grateful for it. What are some of those topics that really resonated with people? Those that you wouldn't expect on the Happiness Habit podcast, but that really came up and people really connected with? Oh, gosh. I would say the three main themes were this idea of self-abandonment, just the things that we do that are so destructive to our well-being that are honestly self self-inflicted. We have these emotional addictions to bad people and bad things and horrible self-talk. And so definitely just that self-abuse, that concept of self-abuse and what that entails. Um, and then again, unhealthy relationship dynamics, unhealthy relationship dynamics, whether it be family or intimate or mother to child, uh, you know, dealing with parental childhood wounds that were never that were never addressed, that absolutely inform our adult behavior. And then I would say just the mental, the mental tornadic activity that we all go through that nobody really wants to talk about as far as, you know, we all talk about, we have, oh yeah, my mind races or I have mental chatter and all that. But diving into maybe the dark corner of that, where it really gets destructive, where we don't really want to admit that when left to my own devices, my mind goes to very bad places. I feel like there's so few conversations about, like you said, pursuing uncomfortable, going into a dark corner and going, what is going on here? Where are my needs getting met in this completely self-flatulating obsession of believing that I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough or that there's something inherently wrong with me? And so I'm like, no, hell yeah, hell no, let's go there. Let's all go there. Let's break open that, turn a light on it and like actually break down what happens in the mind, what happens in the spirit, what happens when left to the poisonous detriment of trauma going unhealed. And it's I, I feel like it's been really well received. People are actually. We spent a long time in 2020 scared to death of who we really are and the truth, the stark truth of that, the unflattering light of. My relationships actually suck. My life is kind of built on a whole bunch of facade. My personal imagery and who I've presented is entirely falsified. 2021, we're still asking those questions. We're doing a little bit of searching, but we're so satiated with information that we feel at peace because we're getting a lot of answers. 2022, it's like the answers aren't quite cutting it anymore. We're still, we now know what we know. 
but we're still pulling ourselves into these crappy scenarios. But now we know that they're crappy. It's like you can't unsee it. 2023, we're like, rubber meets the road. Show me what to do now. So it's been an interesting evolution to watch that subject matter transform my audience as well as myself. I mean, I'm definitely, it started out, I was pitching knowledge from my my ego. I'm thinking I'm going to help people. I'm going to go into the world. But it was definitely a qualifier journey for me as well. I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually, now that we're in here, I'm noticing I got significant blind spots. Let's break those open too. So it's been a beautiful, beautiful um, evolution to watch. A couple of things came to mind for me when you were discussing that. The first is that mindset seems to be a common factor in all that you mentioned. That voice that's in our head, that's talking, the tapes that we have carried with us our whole life. Listen to me dating myself, the tapes that we have in our head. (laughs) And then the other thing is that in that journey, when we embrace uncomfortable we learn to have better questions. Yeah, that's, there's so many things that could be unpacked in just what you said with that. Because in those conversations, especially the internal ones, almost exclusively the internal ones, there are so many, there are so many threads that play on loop that dictate our life, that dictate our actions, that dictate our feelings, that dictate our identity, that with going unturned, if going unchallenged, and especially if going uninterrupted, we live our life on that record. It's just a self-fulfilling prophecy all the time. And it's like a lens. You know, if, if I were to put on glasses or put on contacts, even better, if I'm putting on contacts, you can't see it. I see now everything through that. Mm-hmm. I don't recognize that they're there. I cannot see the contacts on my eyeballs. You know, it's, it's not something that I would even know to question my sight without them. And that's the same thing we do with subconscious beliefs and things that are playing a loop in our mind. We just live our lives through them and without challenging it, without taking out a contact and going, oh my gosh, you are what's changing my sight. Subconscious beliefs are the same thing stories, programs, identities, false narratives that are unchallenged, uninterrupted. It's the same thing. We live our lives according to it. And if without a better question, without somebody willing to go, is that true? Is what's in front of me what I'm actually seeing? We don't have the opportunity to back up and actually see it oh my gosh, there's a reason I'm drowning. I'm standing underneath a waterfall. But until I back up into the cave and see the waterfall and identify that's what's been holding me down, I can't, I don't have the invitation to even create a new reframing process. So asking better questions, but then even more so as, as I've noticed my audience as it's evolved from asking the better question, questioning the question, questioning the presuppositions, We then have to also question the intention of the answer. How I'm answering it, is it with intent to make things better or define things as better or worse? Am I actually intending to make my situation worse with this answer? Is the question presupposing an answer that will prove a confirmation bias or prove another subconscious belief that I'm not even aware of there because multiple multi, most of the time these questions are kind of interwoven with other ones and they're all designed if you have this if you have a a pattern a mental or emotional or identity pattern that is destructive or falls into the identity of well I'm an addict well I'm 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 the abused child well, I'm the orphan I'm the failure Most of the time, your questions are all going to revolve in the same family of proving to itself that story. Your brain has to prove itself. If I say that I'm a failure, all the questions I'm going to ask are going to be in an attempt to answer in the favor that I am a failure to prove it to myself in that concept of familiarity. So it's more than just getting really, really clear on your questions. It's also going, what type of person? 
asks these questions and what must they believe about themselves in order to ask those types of questions. And in the further questioning of this entire process that, that, that details and really reveals what identity am I trying to perpetuate in all of those? It's so fascinating. And in these hundred or so episodes that I've done now, the people that have been on the podcast here that are embracing uncomfortable, that are sharing their stories of inspiration of having gone through this process, there are some common threads through them all. One is, as you mentioned, that voice within that our experience, we just assume without even knowing we're assuming it that our experience is normative for others. Uh, those who had experienced childhood, physical, sexual, social, uh, emotional abuse just assumed that that's the experience that everyone has. Uh, folks that had experienced hardship in other ways just ex assumed that their experience was normative. That's just what people experienced. And the differentiator for all of them was that moment when they realized you know, that was my experience. There are other experiences out there and I can choose to have a different experience. Now, we can't choose to remake or redo our past, but we can certainly learn from it and reframe our story of it to create something new. And I think that's what you're getting at, that these questions, when they move us to different actions, different behaviors, different beliefs. Those are the powerful questions. Absolutely. And I think that it, that definitely falls in line with what I would do with people next is after we kind of get clear on this, this personal audit in the beginning of the journey, then, okay, we can, we can see where it is. And as long as we can hold it in non-judgment and move into the reframing process, that's, that's that you kind of let go of all these things that would tack it down into your mind. And lack of resistance is one of them, just being able to hold space that, like you said, that was made normal to me. We don't have any other construct to abide by. We go into this, we're born into a dynamic, and what it is, is all we know. That is our globe. Only until we move out of that home and we realize that our, maybe it goes from house to neighborhood to neighborhood to community to community to region to region to now we have a little bit more of a global scale. And only then can we kind of do these, take these comparison notes of like, what was, what was normal for me compared to what was normal for somebody else? And it, I was no exception. I remember the first time I ever left the country and God, it, that was such a, a, you know, when they say the word culture shock. That is an indicator that your model of the world was just that limited. And so we have the same type of thing where we realize our model of the world is incredibly limited, inherently limited. Honestly, we're born into the limitation, this, this almost blindsided, narrowly focused, narrowly informed, narrowly everything lens and model of, of the way that life is, the way that family is, the way that love is, what money is, what all of these things that we eventually kind of tool around in until we figure out, oh, I can actually reverse engineer this, but without the questioning process. And then, you know, you have to also have a, a target of what you want. And that's where most of us, if we can, if we can reframe this and challenge this and question this, that's beautiful. But most of us can't tell you, OK, I'd like to move from this to Z. This is my Z. This is my X that I'm the target that I'm working for. You can tell me what you don't want. Most people say, well, I just don't want to end up like my mom or, you know, I just I just don't want to be shuffling in a bathrobe homeless on the streets, you know, an inherent failure. I just don't want to end up like my dad who was an alcoholic, you know. And so we have all these targets we don't want to hit. But that doesn't tell us, that doesn't give us any polarized path straight through it. We end up hitting all these targets that we, if we never want to hit. There's mm -hmm. actually a fascinating um, story. Even Tony told me uh, years ago, he said that um, there's an, a pole, a curved road that has a light pole or a, I think, I believe it's a light pole in Alaska. There's a curve. This pole is just placed such that it takes the focus of the driver. This is the most crashed into pole in the world. Why? Because it's an object of 
I don't want to hit that pole right at that turn. And so we focus where? Not on the road, but on the pole. And that's the same thing with all of the metrics that we don't want to hit in our own life. I just don't want to crash into the pole. Inevitably, we end up perpetually crashing into poles in our lives. It's like we don't do what we want. We do what we must. We don't have what we want. We have what we need. It's it's the same thing. It's that law of just the satiation and law of necessity. So we have to also get clear then on our target, clear on who we want to be, who that is, what, to the extent of what do they talk about? How do they dress? How do they get up in the morning? How do they engineer their day? How do they speak? How do they carry themselves? How do they stand? All of it. What are the habits of that type of person? What are the beliefs of that type of person? How do they speak? What's their language? What's their tone of voice? All the way, the, the clearer you can be on that, everything else can be informed by that. If I know who I am, I know what I want. If I know what I want, I know what I must do. So pretty much all questions come from the clarity of the identity of that person. If people say, I don't want to, I don't know what I want. I don't know what to do. Essentially, you're telling me in a fractory sense, I don't know who I am in the context context of wealth, the context of relationship, the context of health, what that actually looks like. So it's, It's a fascinating process. It's a lot less mysterious than it's made out to be. And the more clarity that we can build around the conversations of that, the more we can empower people to actually take a proactive role in their own journey. I love that. Uh, A metaphor I like to use here in central Illinois, I live in the middle of the cornfields and the bean fields. With the roads, the rural landscape and the roads, are like driving on a piece of graph paper. They go north and south. They go east and west. Occasionally, you'll have a curve or a diagonal. But basically, if you're going somewhere and you know it's west, you don't have to have the exact road. You just know if I keep heading west, I'm going to run into it. I don't know where this road's going to go. I don't know where that road's going to go, but I know I want to go west. So I'll keep heading in that direction and this road curved. Okay, now I need to make another turn and get onto this road to continue west. Having that fixation on the destination allows you to make adjustments along the way that as long as the path is taking you where you want to go, stay on it. But when it doesn't, it's time to pivot, time to adjust, time to take a new path. And putting that with what you're saying is, you know, what what are you focused on? What's your finish line? What's your goal? Focus on those, not on the interruptions in the meantime. Absolutely. My uh, my good friend, Ken Jocelyn, broke something down fairly similar. And then after he did, it was this. I had a slew of conversations after mine with him that proved the same thing, that all other people that I I would consider successful or fulfilled or happy or clear and dedicated. They have a soul focus that's that's apparent in their life, apparent in their relationships, apparent in their finances, all of that. He says incremental, not monumental. Mm-hmm. And then to pair that with something my my friend Cody Jefferson says, he said, you know, have the identity piece fixed. Know who you're gonna be. Everything else is informed by that. So what that tells me is find your find your target. Find your step 10. Find your ideal vision for now. Set it in stone. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be the finished final draft. It could be a shitty first draft. And then the small incremental steps that you can do on the daily. Most people get in their own way because they think that the steps that they're going to take today won't be big enough. Mm. And it's like, it's so, it's, it's frustrating, but it's so understandable. I think that to a certain degree, we all struggle from this. It's just that, I know what I want, but it, you, we, we focus on the gap, this massive differential between where I am now and where I want to be. And we just continue to gaslight ourselves that that distance cannot be, tra- we cannot be broken down into small, daily, incremental, repeatable actions. And Brian Covey, I had an interview with him just not too long ago that talks about that. What are some of the things that are guiding you toward this target? that can be done on a day-to-day basis, repeatable small actions. And then you're just building these small, tiny micro promises to your future self. You can't fail. You Mm. literally cannot fail. Small daily actions, 
repeated that move toward that target that you've already vetted move you toward your target. Now, I'm not talking about busyness. I'm not talking about distraction and focus. Like if the task that you're doing on the daily that you vet that those things are actually moving, going to move you toward that target, success is inevitable. At least, not necessarily success, but your target is inevitable. We prove this into our lives all the time. If we have something that's not going the way we want, reverse engineer it on the small daily things that you're doing. Do they make sense for that not going the way you want? 100%. They're maligned to your ideal. And the same can be said for something that you would consider ideal. What does that look like on a day-to-day basis? Take the 10. Take the, the final step, the arrival point. Obviously, the arrival point always moves for those of us in the personal development space. But take the arrival point and break it down. What does this human being's morning look like? What is this human being's schedule? What is their bank account? What are some of the habits and the practices? What are some of the beliefs? What are their non-negotiables? Really essential. What are some of the identity pieces? Like, if you were to break down to me the habits and the trajectories of an athlete, notice athlete is identity. That's not saying someone who works out five to six times a week. That's still a non-athlete trying to force a habit. But if you take an athlete, this is who I am, so this is what I do. That was the, the sentiment that Cody shared with me. He's like, this is who I am, so this is what I do. How can we take the step 10 of this is who I am? This is who I am becoming. So what do they do on a day-to-day basis? You can't lose with a, with a slot machine like that. You're, just, you're plugging in winning coins every single day. Absolutely. I have a doctor that's phenomenal. Uh, This doctor doesn't treat symptoms. This doctor will do that when necessary, but focuses on overall health, Uh, not only looking at the spirit, at the physical, but also the spiritual, also the emotional. What are you wrestling with? What are you doing? And told me point blank, said, you are not going to change your life until you change something you do every single day. Mm. That was a powerful message to hear especially coming from a doctor absolutely and thank goodness what would we be where could we be if more doctors practiced in that manner but so true the little things that we do every single day I love it and that that absolutely when you find yourself stuck in any capacity you can pretty much always refer back to the basics of, okay, the, up to the point of feeling stuck, what was I doing that would have reverse engineered stuckness? You can yeah. always find a clue. You can always find either a pattern, pattern of thinking, a pattern of emotion or feeling, and a pattern of behavior that brought about a feeling of stuckness. It may have snuck in. I'm not saying that people intend to, you know, self-sabotage. Sometimes it is something that is very, very informed by fear, but sometimes it's just, you're not stuck. You're just programmed. You are where you are. And that still needs to be just corrected out. It's something that's like, hey, thank you for revealing a new habit to me. Thank you for revealing a tendency that I now have, I can now pull into my awareness and reverse engineer a little bit of a, I guess, a security measure to kind of barricade my, insulate myself from that type of hijacking. But those things happen. Those things, things come. I don't know how many times I, you know, I'm probably would say about year seven of significantly intentional personal development journey. I've I've been doing this for seven years. And this year, this week, this month, I still woke up and I find myself going, yep, that's pretty cyclical. All right. What's, what's that? What's that about having to overturn this, overturn the stone and ask the, the question, where is this coming from? What need is this belief, thinking pattern, feeling pattern, behavior pattern? What need is it serving? And it's usually some sort of fear, fear of failure, Feel up fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, fear of fear of success sometimes. And so you gotta kind of pull into it. Then the you if you have your if you have your your set path and it's certain and you know what you're doing, 
all the little derailments and curveballs are very contrasted. You can tell when they're happening. You can feel it in your gut. You're like, I, I'm significantly anxious today. What's going on? Okay, well, you have, you have a women's conference you're speaking at. To be expected that this is going to come up. What is in that? Where is my desire for comfort showing up here? Where is my desire to play small? Where is my desire to self-sabotage? Where is it coming from? What does it look like? How is it manifesting? And then how can I choose again? Realign myself to, okay, no, this is what I want. This is who I am. So this is what I do. And yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's, we're not without, we're not without um, guaranteeing that there's going to be some things that, that come up along the way to really throw us off. But if we have the identity piece set, uh, I find the recalibration back to that is much easier. Newton's laws of thermodynamics, one of them, one of the three says that an object in motion tends to stay in motion. And that's both the bad news, good news reclamation there. Uh, the bad habits, yeah, they have momentum. They tend to keep going and it's going to take a concerted effort to change that. And the good news is once you establish a good habit, there's going to be momentum behind it and it's going to be uh, it's going to tend to stay in motion. It's going to tend to stay going. So, you know, make the hard effort at once. It's a choose your pain kind of situation. Do you want the pain of changing this bad habit? Or do you want the continued pain of keeping that bad habit, which right. is going to serve you more? 100%. There are so many different pain leverage points that we have to get honest about. Because up to a certain point, the pain of changing was actually greater than the pain of staying the same. I, it was this warm, sick familiarity of my life being kind of blasé and unfulfilling and extremely lackluster. But, you know, until 2015, 2016, that was acceptable because my life had been utter, complete chaos until that point, And I had developed myself at least a sense of structure. It was, you know, an unfulfilling marriage, a career that I was climbing that was fairly just insignificant. It didn't serve any kind of purpose for me. There was, you know, health that I was eating food-like substances and not food, but it was, you know, I was, I didn't know any different. And so the pain of familiarity was a lot less than the pain of change. The pain of the unknown, the fear of the unknown was staggering. I used to run perpetually, just run away from it, almost at face value. If it was, un if it was different to me, if it was unknown to me, it was like immediately just, I don't go there. And, you know, life crisis and trauma and things like that all can kind of jar us into all of a sudden this pain leverage of the familiarity is like, now it's 51%. Now the idea of the devil I don't know appeals to me a little bit more than the devil I do know. It's like, I know the ins and outs of this life and it does not serve me. It, it is absolutely more painful. I'm so sick of being here. And so not another day, not another minute, not another second. Tony Robbins even calls this the altered state. You finally get to a place where the law of familiarity and where you are just sickens you beyond, like, I can't, I can't take myself anymore. And that was, that was true for me too. And moving into the unknown, challenging what I did know, it was uncomfortable, but it was a different kind of discomfort. Something had changed in the structure of my mind that actually ran toward the unknown. It was because I was starting to question, well, maybe the devil I don't know isn't a devil. Maybe it's actually something that will eventually would better me, improve my life, improve a situation. It's like, well, anything's better than that. And when you get to the point where it's like anything's better than that, you are in a magical place. You're in the wilderness and it's you're definitely off path and there is some significant brush around you. It's like pulling open the catacombs of all this crap and having to arc, organize the archive of all the crap that you've been just letting sit and stockpile. But the, the gumption, the something something shifts where you're like i that's tolerable this is intolerable the way that it used to be is intolerable i'd rather deal with 
I'd rather deal with the raw underbelly of like, say, the Matrix. You know, it's like the, this life, because the steak becomes tasteless. And now this, you know, you can't take the pill and you can't unsee the way the, the, the life that you used to have. Yes. What, what it, is ignorance bliss? What I sometimes just like to be like, I wish I just didn't know any of this sometimes. But ultimately, it's like, no, there's that's informed by fear of this uncharted territory, this discomfort of constantly evolving, constantly arriving, constantly departing from what you did know. It's it can be it can be a lot. But um, when I look back at the comparable. That that pain of regret, just like you said, the pain of regret is infinitely heavier and more intolerable to the soul than if we just if we just faced it head on and you know, the per, the fire of purification and allowed ourselves to to embrace that uncomfortability. It's 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 so funny to um, to observe our human nature that it is essentially just will sit on a hot stove as a boiling frog and and just boil ourselves into these lives of accepting the status quo, accepting the crappy job and the unfulfilling relationship and all of that. And when we do actually we do actually see all that clearly for what it is, it's um we recognize that no matter how much it would be nice to maybe go, oh, well, maybe it wasn't boiling. Maybe it was just a nice little, it was a hot tub. But it's like we ultimately know that we would be gaslighting ourselves into settling for something less. And if you're not familiar with the imagery and the metaphor of the boiling frog, it goes back to if you put a frog in a pan of water, it's fine. It's comfortable. And if you turn it up just one degree, still fine, still comfortable. And over time, that one degree change isn't noticeable until it absolutely boils you. So don't let your life be like that. Don't let one degree more, one degree more creep in. And friends, if you'd like to learn more, if you'd like to check out the happiness habit, uh, the links are in the show notes to connect with Kara and podcast. I invite you to do that. You'll not be sorry at all you did you'll be really pleased with yourself for clicking that link so be sure you do and Kara are there any last thoughts you'd like to share with us today the only thing that I would say is for anybody listening to all of this and these questions is just like if you show up today if you promise yourself today and you keep that promise that is the ultimate pathway to that self trust and the confidence that you need for the road ahead just it's small daily promises that you don't break to yourself that is that is the key that i would want to leave everyone behind with thank you kara